When it comes to choosing gear for a car audio build, what considerations do we need to make? How do we pick the right size speakers, choose a subwoofer size, and pick an amplifier that properly matches? Well guys, we're about to start a new build project here on the channel, so I figured why not take you guys along for the ride on picking out all of this gear. Even though you might not have the same vehicle that I'm planning for in this video, the tips and process I'm going to show you here can be applied to any application. I'm Mark, welcome to Car Audio Fabrication, the channel where together we learn how to master car audio and how to design, build, and install our dream car audio system. Let's get started. Now before we can start picking out all of our gear, it is critical that we understand our goals for the system. So for this build, my first system goal is to upgrade all of the speakers using the factory locations. On this particular project, we want to minimize the amount of custom fabrication that we need to do in order to get the speakers mounted into the vehicle. This means we want to pick speakers that will easily match the factory locations in size, and we also want to be able to get off the shelf brackets if they are available. This also means at some point we need to consider getting some simple sound treatment materials that we can apply around those factory locations. Now our next goal for this system, and this is a popular one here, we want to add more bass. The factory system simply isn't cutting it, and we don't only want to add more bass, we want to add a fun amount of bass. So whether we want to add just a little bit of bass reinforcement, a fun amount of bass, or an absolutely insane amount of bass, that kind of determines what power level we're going to need from our amplifiers, which we will be talking about later. Our next system goal, with that said, that we want a fun amount of bass is to use the stock electrical system of the vehicle. We don't want to have to do any electrical upgrades, and we want to keep the system rather compact. We want to keep the system compact because this is going into a sedan where we want to retain the use of the trunk for storage of different items. Knowing that we don't want to do any major electrical upgrades also tells us what sort of amplifier power we want to use more on this later. Our next system goal is retain the use of the factory head unit. We've talked about this quite a bit on the channel. Unfortunately, in a lot of newer vehicles, you can't simply swap out the head unit to an aftermarket model. We want to consider this as a system goal up front because that tells us we're going to need to be able to get some sort of integration devices in order to interface with the factory audio system. More on that shortly as well. And the last system goal that we need to consider is of course our budget. On this particular project, this is a bit of a mid range budget, I want to be under $4,000. I know, I know, I totally agree. $4,000 is still quite the chunk of money to work with, so we're definitely going to be able to build ourselves a really nice system here. But something to note here, this particular vehicle currently has the OEM basic sound package, and if we did want to upgrade to that factory premium package, that would be a $900 required upgrade plus a $2,100 upgrade. So just in comparison, you'd be looking at about three grand to upgrade the trim levels in order to get that factory premium system. Obviously that trim level upgrade upgrades other things in the vehicle as well, but it's still worth noting because we're going to be able to get substantially better performance out of this aftermarket system. Let's head on over to the computer and start finding our gear. All right, guys, so here we are. If you watched my previous video on 3D scanning, you know that I'm planning on doing a project in a 2021 Elantra. This build is actually for my brother-in-law. He's wanted to have a custom car audio system in his car for a long, long time, and we're finally gonna make it happen. I'm excited, and so is he. So to start doing our research and picking out all of our gear, we're going to be using show sponsor Crutchfield. On the Crutchfield website, we can enter the year, make, and model of our vehicle, and we can also pick any of the factory or pre premium system options and see if they've done research for our particular vehicle. If they've researched your vehicle and made this document here with a qualifying purchase, you can get access to this. This is the research notes. This document is going to give us a bunch of really valuable information, things like all of the different wiring colors, where to access a factory amplifier if it is a factory premium system, and the step-by-step -step process for accessing some of the different speakers within the vehicle. As you can imagine, when it comes to doing the actual installation process, in your vehicle, having this document right here is very beneficial. If you guys want to learn more about Crutchfield and take advantage of a special offer for car audio fabrication fans, check out the links down in the video description. So as we mentioned earlier, one of our goals for this car audio system is we want to use the factory head unit. And that's a good thing because as we can see from the research here on Crutchfield, they don't recommend replacing the radio in the vehicle. And that's likely because there's not a good interface solution for this particular vehicle and also because of 
of the size of the radio. There's no good fit kit. There's nothing really on the market that's going to allow us to make this an easy task. A common issue in today's latest vehicles when you go to use the stock head unit or even the stock premium amplifier as the source for the system is that source unit will shut off its outputs if you're only using the outputs for a signal source. In other words, once you disconnect the load of a speaker, that source unit is going to think that that speaker is disconnected and it should mute that channel, which is obviously a bad thing if we're trying to use that signal to amplify the rest of our system. So it's always a good idea to get yourself one of these load generating devices. In this particular case, I'm going to be getting the AC-LGD20. And that's because if I look at the application guide for the LGDs, I can see that the 2017 to 2022 Elantra, that's what they recommend, the AC-LGD20. There's a couple of other options depending on your application, the AC-LGD, and then there's also the AC-LGD60. The next thing I need to plan for is because I'm using a factory signal, I need a way to correct that factory signal. For this, I'm gonna be using one of JL Audio's FIX processors, and there's two different options here. There's either the FIX82 or FIX86. The reason I'm going to be using the FIX86 is the 82 only gives me two channels of output. So if I wanted to do a front rear fix, using the actual factory head unit, I wouldn't be able to do so with the 82 because I only have the two channels out. With the FIX-86, it actually gives me six channels out. You can have front, rear, and then an independent subwoofer. But in this case, I'm gonna be using the front and rear. That way I retain the front to back fade. The advantage of this device, if we look at this picture here, this is a good way to illustrate it. So a lot of times in a factory audio system, you're going to see equalization applied out of the factory head unit. And the car manufacturers, they do that to make their inexpensive stock speakers actually sound somewhat acceptable. It makes sense. That's the reason that we love to add digital signal processors to a system. That way we can fully tune the performance of each speaker. But the thing is, once we start swapping out those stock speakers, we need to correct that signal back to a usable signal. And one of the things that the fix can do is it can de-EQ. In other words, it can de-equalize the signal. And you can see an example of that here. In this case here, they're summing a couple of different signals together in order to get this flat signal. And in some of my early research on the Elantra here, I know that I have a full range usable signal. It just has a bunch of equalization applied that I'm going to need to flatten out. Now with that said, it is worth noting that this particular factory source unit, I'm pretty sure has all pass filters, which the FIX86 does not correct all pass filters, but I can still use them in my system design if I properly plan for them and do the right tuning. It's also worth noting that we don't absolutely have to use a device like this if we wanna upgrade our car audio system. Just note that if you're not using a device to somehow correct that factory equalization, you're going to have some factory equalization applied even once you start swapping out amplifiers and new speakers. In this particular application, because I plan to also use DSP, I wanna make sure that we start with a nice clean signal and we're gonna start with using this. Next up, we want to pick our speakers. So here on Crutchfield, we're going to minimize that and we're gonna to go to the speaker section here and you can see they've called out the different speaker locations and we can choose one of these and we can pick a speaker model that's going to properly fit in that location. I typically like to start with the lower front door location and that's because this is going to recommend some different component speakers and in that upper location, I already know from looking at it, that this is a smaller tweeter location. You can see that tweeters are going to fit there. It's not big enough for a mid-range speaker. And remember, one of our system goals is we want to minimize the amount of fabrication that we need to do when it comes to installing the speakers themselves. So like I said, we're gonna start with this lower front door location and we're going to pick a component set of speakers. Something I really like about the Crutchfield website is you can see that there's currently 124 different options. That's quite a lot of options, but what we can do is we can start using filters to filter out and narrow down our choices. Now in this case, JL Audio was cool enough to sponsor all of the gear for this project, so I'm gonna be picking from their lineup of speakers. I tell you guys this because I want to be transparent with you guys. There are tons of great car audio brands out there. Choose from the brand that you like. I like JL Audio. Their gear has never let me down and I've used them for a long time, long before I ever started the channel. The point to take away here is the selection process of the speakers that we're about to talk about. By choosing a brand here and using Crutchfield's research, I've narrowed this down to 
five different options. Now, first off, it's typically best to get the largest woofer speaker that you can get in that particular location. So a good example here is you can see that the is the C2 600, which is the six inch version, but they're also saying that the C2 650, which is the six and a half inch component woofer will also fit in this location. In that case, I of course want to opt for the slightly larger speaker. Now this does get a little bit different when you're using a speaker location that will allow for a six by nine. Sometimes you might opt to use a six and a half inch speaker depending on the sound quality performance that you're going for. But in this particular case, this is a round speaker location. So we're going to be using this. If we click see vehicle details here, we can see that the woofer is going to have no problem fitting in that lower front door. We can also get some mounting brackets. So that's going to make the process easier for installation. We'll of course do a couple of install tricks to make sure that these adapters work really well with some proper sound treatment. And it's also worth noting for the tweeter location, they are saying that it fits in the upper front door location but they have this little kind of warning logo here. And the reason for that warning logo is there's not going to be an off the shelf adapter that we can use for the tweeter. We are going to have to custom make some sort of solution to hold the tweeter in place. If you're familiar with JL Audio's product line, you know that there's also a C3 and a C7 speaker currently available, and you'll notice that none of those are listed here. And that's because of their dimensions. They're a little bit too large. And for this application anyway, I'm looking to go with more of a mid-budget speaker, just so that we make sure that we stay under that $4,000 mark. So here we're going to be selecting these. A quick side note, if you are using Crutchfield to pick out your gear, you're going to notice this right here when we go to pick those speakers and we actually add them to cart, you're going to see that a lot of times with a qualifying purchase, they're going to give us some of the different wiring harnesses and mounting brackets for free. And this is what's going to also get us those research notes that we were talking about earlier. You can of course, always decline these parts but nah we want them we're adding them to cart now we of course also need rear speakers so in this case i use that same process to select these these are the c1-650x the x means that these are a coaxial style speaker so you'll note in this case this is not a component speaker with a separate tweeter it has the tweeter mounted as part of the entire speaker i want to make sure that we come in under budget and we're just using these speakers for rear fill anyway so we're going with those entry level c1s so we have our speakers picked out. Now we wanna pick out our subwoofers and we're gonna look at all component subwoofers. In this case, I'm going to narrow things down to JL Audio. And I already did a bunch of measurements in the trunk of the vehicle where I plan on putting the subwoofers. And those measurements told me that based on the width and the height, a good idea would probably be to use two 12s. I'm really paraphrasing this part of the process here and making it super simple. If you guys wanna see a more detailed video on choosing a subwoofer size, because there is a lot that goes into it and I don't wanna make this video too long, check out that link up in the corner of the screen. On Crutchfield here though, I'm going to narrow down to our 12 inch size. And at the beginning of the video, I talked about having a goal of having a fun amount of bass. To me, there's entry level bass, a fun amount of bass, and a ridiculous amount of competition level bass. This case here, we're right in the middle and we're going to be wanting to use, you know, anywhere from 500 up to a thousand watts of power. And that's total because we have two subwoofers. So we're looking anywhere from 250 up to 500 watts. I can limit that as well. Let's pick these three options here. And the other thing in my particular application to consider is I want to still have a usable amount of space in the trunk, which means that we're probably going to want to go with a shallow mount subwoofer. So this has really narrowed it down to one model of subwoofer and that's the JL Audio 12 TW3. This is a shallow mount subwoofer that has a power rating of 400 watts. I've used these before on the channel and I know that in even a sealed enclosure, these can really dig deep. They sound super good and they can create a ton of output for what they are. So really, I just have to pick between these two and I'm going to choose depending on the final ohm load that I'm looking to have present at the amplifier. I just know based on experience that if I use two dual A ohm subwoofers, I'm going to be able to get a two ohm load at the amplifier. And a lot of JL Audio's subwoofer amplifiers are stable at two ohms. 
But if you're not familiar with subwoofer wiring, a couple of resources you could check is one, you could always check the owner's manual. In this case here, we can see right here that if we have two subwoofers that are dual A ohm, we can present a two ohm load to the amp. And another resource, if we just look up subwoofer wiring diagrams here on Crutchfield, we could choose how many subwoofers we're using. We could do something as crazy as four subwoofers and you can see the different wiring options. What if we were using a one ohm load subwoofer amplifier right there you could see that we could take these four single voice coil four ohm subwoofers and wire them down to one ohm so you can see all the different options on that site so we're going to get two of these added to cart now that we have our speakers and our subwoofers selected we need to choose the amplifier to power them remember we have a couple of system goals to adhere to here one being that we don't want to do any major electrical upgrades in the vehicle that means that at most we should use around a thousand watts rms of power. Again, this power level that we're going to select depends on a few different factors, more than we're going to go into detail on this video on. But if you'd like to see a past video where I went through that process, you can check that out at the link on screen. The other system goal to consider is we want our system to be compact. So it's a good idea to use a five channel amplifier. That way we can power all of our speakers and all of our subwoofers all in one amplifier and keep everything nice and tidy for an easy install. So we're going to choose the five channel amplifier option here and again, narrow down to JL Audio. Now I mentioned previously in the video, and I've mentioned this many times on the channel, I want to have a digital signal processor as part of this system. That way I can fully tune every channel of output coming out of the amplifier. So I want to pick an amplifier that has a DSP built in. Of course, you could pick some of these other five channel amplifier options, and you could have an external DSP, but again, going with that goal of having everything be nice and compact, it's good to have a DSP built into the amp. So under general features here, I'm going to turn on built-in DSP, and that's going to give us two different options here. There's the VX700 slash 5i and VX1000 slash 5i. So you can see the five means both of these are five channel amplifiers, which we know already based on our selection here, but this gives us 700 watts RMS of power, and this gives us a thousand watts RMS of power. You can see right here that the speaker channels have the same output power, 75 watts RMS times four, at four ohms, but the difference between these two amps is the amount of power on the subwoofer channel. So because I picked those 12 TW3s earlier, we want to look at this information here from the manufacturer. This is the recommended power band for the 12 TW3. You can see that it's anywhere from about 200 watts RMS or so up to about 400 watts RMS. And you can see that right in the middle where they call optimum, that's right around the 300 watt RMS range. So with 600 watts RMS available for the subwoofer channel at two ohms, this is going to be perfect since each subwoofer will be able to use 300 watts RMS. So we added that amplifier to cart and some of you might've noticed that, you know, it has 75 watts RMS per channel to work with. And you're gonna notice that on the C2 component set here that we plan on using, this power rating here is up to 60 watts RMS. Typically when choosing an amplifier, I like to pick an amplifier that's going to power the speakers at the upper end of their range. And you can even see in this tech article that Crutchfield has on their site, they say with an external amplifier, you should pick an amp with a power rating in the upper end of your speaker's power range. And they also go on to note that it's better to overpower a speaker than to underpower it. I can't agree with this more, and that's because like they say here, the distortion caused when you push a low powered amp or receiver to its limit is much more likely to harm a speaker than too much power. As long as I properly tune and set up the amplifier on this system, these C2s are going to be just fine on that VX1000 slash 5i. So we've got all the main system components picked out, and also don't forget there's always going to be some accessories that you might wanna add. For example, I might wanna add a couple of the grills in order to protect these subwoofers in the trunk. That way we can keep the trunk space usable, not be worried about stuff being back there and potentially damaging the subwoofers. And we might want to also get ourselves an auxiliary knob to control the volume level of the subwoofer independently. And in our case here, this is the DRC-100, which is compatible with the VXI amplifier. It's also going to allow us to use the push button functionality, which will change the color of this LED so that we can determine which tuning preset we are on that we've set up in the software. With all the gear that we've selected added to cart, you can see we've also met our system goal of being under $4,000 
right here, we've come in under budget. Now that we have a plan for all the components we wanna get for this build, we of course also need to get all of the electrical wiring and power distribution parts. If you guys would like to see a video on that process for this project, be sure to let me know. Next time you're planning a car audio project, don't forget to check out our show sponsor, Crutchfield. You guys can learn more and get a special offer to help you save on some of that gear at the links down in the video description. A big thanks to them along with Jerry, Joseph, William, and the rest of the Patreon membership team. A big thanks to all those guys for making these videos possible and thank you for tuning in and watching.